Chapter One of Victorian Short Stories Tales of Courtship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Victorian Short Stories Tales of Courtship by Hubert Crackenthorpe et al. Angela An Inverted Love Story by William Schwenk gilbert from the century magazine september eighteen ninety i am a poor paralyzed fellow who for many years past has been confined to a bed or a sofa for the last six years i have occupied a small room giving on to one of the side canals of venice and having no one about me but a deaf old woman who makes my bed and attends to my food and there I eke out a poor income of about thirty pounds a year by making water-colour drawings of flowers and fruit. They are the cheapest models in Venice. And these I send to a friend in London, who sells them to a dealer for small sums. But on the whole I am happy and content. It is necessary that I should describe the position of my room rather minutely. Its only window is about five feet above the water of the canal and above it the house projects some six feet, and overhangs the water, the projecting portion being supported by stout piles driven into the bed of the canal. This arrangement has a disadvantage, among others, of so limiting my upward view, that I am unable to see more than about ten feet of the height of the house immediately opposite to me, although, by reaching as far out of the window as my infirmity will permit, i can see for a considerable distance up and down the canal which does not exceed fifteen feet in width but although i can see but little of the material house opposite i can see its reflection upside down in the canal and i take a good deal of inverted interest in such of its inhabitants as show themselves from time to time always upside down on its balconies and in its windows when i first occupied my room about six years ago my attention was directed to the reflection of a little girl of thirteen or so as nearly as i could judge who passed every day on a balcony just above the upward range of my limited field of view she had a glass of flowers and a crucifix on a little table by her side and as she sat there in fine weather from early morning until dark working assiduously all the time i concluded that she earned her living by needlework she was certainly an industrious little girl, and, as far as I could judge by her upside-down reflection, neat in her dress and pretty. She had an old mother, an invalid, who on warm days would sit on the balcony with her, and it interested me to see the little maid wrap the old lady in shawls and bring pillows for her chair, and a stool for her feet, and every now and again lay down her work and kiss and fondle the old lady for half a minute, and then take up her work again time went by and as the little maid grew up her reflection grew down and at last she was quite a little woman of i suppose sixteen or seventeen i can only work for a couple of hours or so in the brightest part of the day so i had plenty of time on my hands in which to watch her movements and sufficient imagination to weave a little romance about her and to endow her with a beauty which to a great extent i had taken for granted i saw or fancied that i could see that she began to take an interest in my reflection which of course she could see as i could see hers and one day when it appeared to me that she was looking right at it that is to say when her reflection appeared to be looking right at me i tried the desperate experiment of nodding to her and to my intense delight her reflection nodded in reply and so our two reflections became known to one another it did not take me very long to fall in love with her but a long time passed before i could make up my mind to do more than nod to her every morning when the old woman moved me from my bed to the sofa at the window and again in the evening when the little maid left the balcony for that day one day however when i saw her reflection looking at mine i nodded to her and threw a flower into the canal she nodded several times in return and i saw her direct her mother's attention to the incident then every morning i threw a flower into the water for good morning 
and another in the evening for good night and i soon discovered that i had not altogether thrown them in vain for one day she threw a flower to join mine and she laughed and clapped her hands when she saw the two flowers join forces and float away together and then every morning and every evening she threw her flower when i threw mine and when the two flowers met she clapped her hands and so did i but when they were separated as they sometimes were owing to one of them having met an obstruction which did not catch the other she threw up her hands in a pretty affectation of despair which i tried to imitate but in an english and unsuccessful fashion and when they were rudely run down by a passing gondola which happened not unfrequently she pretended to cry and i did the same then in pretty pantomime she would point downwards to the sky to tell me that it was destiny that had caused the shipwreck of our flowers and i in pantomime not nearly so pretty would try to convey to her that destiny would be kinder next time and that perhaps to-morrow our flowers would be more fortunate and so the innocent courtship went on one day she showed me her crucifix and kissed it and thereupon i took a little silver crucifix that always stood by me and kissed that and so she knew that we were one in religion one day the little maid did not appear on the balcony and for several days i saw nothing of her and although i threw my flowers as usual no flower came to keep it company however after a time she reappeared dressed in black and crying often and then i knew that the poor child's mother was dead and as far as i knew she was alone in the world the flowers came no more for many days nor did she show any sign of recognition but kept her eyes on her work except when she placed her handkerchief to them and opposite to her was the old lady's chair and i could see that from time to time she would lay down her work and gaze at it and then a flood of tears would come to her relief but at last one day she roused herself to nod to me and then her flower came day by day and my flower went forth to join it and with varying fortunes the two flowers sailed away as of yore but the darkest day of all to me was when a good-looking young gondolier standing right end uppermost in his gondola for i could see him in the flesh worked his craft alongside the house and stood talking to her as she sat on the balcony they seemed to speak as old friends indeed as well as i could make out he held her by the hand during the whole of their interview which lasted quite half an hour eventually he pushed off and left my heart heavy within me but i soon took heart of grace for as soon as he was out of sight the little maid threw two flowers growing on the same stem an allegory of which i could make nothing until it broke upon me that she meant to convey to me that he and she were brother and sister and that i had no cause to be sad and thereupon i nodded to her cheerily and she nodded to me and laughed aloud and i laughed in return and all went on again as before then came a dark and dreary time for it became necessary that i should undergo treatment that confined me absolutely to my bed for many days and i worried and fretted to think that the little maid and i should see each other no longer and worse still that she would think that i had gone away without even hinting to her that i was going and i lay awake at night wondering how i could let her know the truth and fifty plans flitted through my brain all appearing to be feasible enough at night but absolutely wild and impracticable in the morning one day and it was a bright day indeed for me the old woman who tended me told me that a gondolier had inquired whether the english seigneur had gone away or had died and so i learned that the little maid had been anxious about me and that she had sent her brother to inquire and the brother had no doubt taken to her the reason of my protracted absence from the window from that day and ever after during my three weeks of bed-keeping a flower was found every morning on the ledge of my window which was within easy reach of any one in a boat and when at last a day came when i could be moved i took my accustomed place on my sofa at the window and the little maid saw me and stood on her head so to speak 
and clapped her hands upside down with a delight that was as eloquent as my right end up delight could be and so the first time the gondolier passed my window i beckoned to him and he pushed alongside and told me with many bright smiles that he was glad indeed to see me well again then i thanked him and his sister for their many kind thoughts about me during my retreat and i then learnt from him that her name was angela and that she was the best and purest maiden in all venice and that any one might think himself happy indeed who could call her sister but he was happier even than her brother for he was to be married to her and indeed they were to be married the next day thereupon my heart seemed to swell to bursting and the blood rushed through my veins so that i could hear it and nothing else for a while i managed at last to stammer forth some words of awkward congratulation and he left me singing merrily after asking permission to bring his bride to see me on the morrow as they returned from church for said he my angela has known you very long ever since she was a child and she has often spoken to me of the poor englishman who was a good catholic and who lay all day long for years and years on a sofa at a window and she had said over and over again how dearly she wished she could speak to him and comfort him and one day when you threw a flower into the canal she asked me whether she might throw another and i told her yes for he would understand that it meant sympathy for one sorely afflicted and so i learned that it was pity and not love except indeed such love as is akin to pity that prompted her to interest herself in my welfare and there was an end of it all for the two flowers that i thought were on one stem were two flowers tied together but i could not tell that and they were meant to indicate that she and the gondolier were affianced lovers and my expressed pleasure at this symbol delighted her for she took it to mean that i rejoiced in her happiness and the next day the gondolier came with a train of other gondoliers all decked in their holiday garb and on his gondola sat angela happy and blushing at her happiness then he and she entered the house in which i dwelt and came into my room and it was strange indeed after so many years of inversion to see her with her head above her feet and then she wished me happiness and a speedy restoration to good health which could never be and i in broken words and with tears in my eyes gave her the little silver crucifix that had stood by my bed or my table for so many years and angela took it reverently and crossed herself and kissed it and so departed with her delighted husband and as i heard the song of the gondoliers as they went their way the song dying away in the distance as the shadows of the sundown closed around me i felt that they were singing the requiem of the only love that had ever entered my heart end of angela by william schwenk gilbert victorian short stories stories of courtship by hubert crackenthorpe and others the parson's daughter of oxney colne by anthony trollope this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson the parson's daughter of oxney colne part one the prettiest scenery in all england and if i am contradicted in that assertion i will say in all europe is in devonshire on the southern and southeastern skirts of dartmoor where the rivers dart and avon and tame form themselves and where the broken moor is half cultivated and the wild-looking uplands fields are half moor in making this assertion i am often met with much doubt but it is by persons who do not really know the locality men and women talk to me on the matter who have travelled down the line of railway from exeter to plymouth who have spent a fortnight at torquay and perhaps made an excursion from tavistock to the convict prison on dartmoor but who knows the glories of chagford who has walked through the parish of manerton who is conversant with lustly cleves and withercombe in the moor 
who has explored holm chase gentle reader believe me that you will be rash in contradicting me unless you have done these things there or thereabouts i will not say by the waters of which little river it is washed is the parish of oxney colne and for those who would wish to see all the beauties of this lovely country a sojourn in oxney colne would be most desirable seeing that the sojourner would then be brought nearer to all that he would delight to visit than at any other spot in the country but there is an objection to any such arrangement there are only two decent houses in the whole parish and these are or were when i knew the locality small and fully occupied by their possessors the larger and better is the parsonage in which lived the parson and his daughter and the smaller is the freehold residence of a certain miss le smerger who owned a farm of a hundred acres which was rented by one farmer cloisy and who also possessed some thirty acres round her own house which she managed herself regarding herself to be quite as great in cream as mr cloisy and altogether superior to him in the article of cider but you has to pay no rent miss farmer cloisy would say and when miss le smerger expressed this opinion of her art in a matter too defiant you pays no rent or you couldn't do it miss le smerger was an old maid with a pedigree and blood of her own a hundred and thirty acres of fee simple land on the borders of dartmoor fifty years of age a constitution of iron and an opinion of her own on every subject under the sun and now for the parson and his daughter the parson's name was woolsworthy or woolworthy as it was pronounced by all those who lived around him the reverend saul woolworthy and his daughter was patience woolworthy or miss patty as she was known to the devonshire world of those parts that name of patience had not been well chosen for her for she was a hot-tempered damsel warm in her convictions and inclined to express them freely she had but two closely intimate friends in the world and by both of them this freedom of expression had been fully permitted to her since she was a child miss le smerger and her father were well accustomed to her ways and on the whole well satisfied with them the former was equally free and equally warm-tempered as herself and as mr woolworthy was allowed by his daughter to be quite paramount on his own subject for he had a subject he did not object to his daughter being paramount on all others a pretty girl was patience woolworthy at the time of which i am writing and one who possessed much that was worthy of remark and admiration had she lived where beauty meets with admiration or where force of character is remarked but at oxney colne on the borders of dartmoor there were few to appreciate her and it seemed as though she herself had but little idea of carrying her talent further afield so that it might not remain for ever wrapped in a blanket she was a pretty girl tall and slender with dark eyes and black hair her eyes were perhaps too round for regular beauty and her hair was perhaps too crisp her mouth was large and expressive her nose was finely formed though a critic in female form might have declared it to be somewhat broad but her countenance altogether was very attractive if only it might be seen with that resolution for dominion which occasionally marred it though sometimes it even added to her attractions it must be confessed on behalf of patience woolworthy that the circumstances of her life had peremptorily called upon her to exercise dominion she had lost her mother when she was sixteen and had had neither brother nor sister she had no neighbours near her fit either from education or rank to interfere in the conduct of her life excepting always miss le smerger miss le smerger would have done anything for her including the whole management of her morals and of the parsonage household had patience been content with such an arrangement but much as patience had ever loved miss le smerger she was not content with this and therefore she had been called on to put forth a strong hand of her own 
she had put forth this strong hand early and hence had come the character which i am attempting to describe but i must say on behalf of this girl that it was not only over others that she thus exercised dominion in acquiring that power she had also acquired the much greater power of exercising rule over herself but why should her father have been ignored in these family arrangements perhaps it may almost suffice to say that of all living men her father was the man best conversant with the antiquities of the county in which he lived he was the jonathan oldback of devonshire and especially of dartmoor but without that decision of character which enabled oldback to keep his womenfolk in some kind of subjection and probably enabled him also to see that his weekly bill did not pass their proper limits our mr oldback of oxney colne was sadly deficient in these respects as a parish pastor with but a small cure he did his duty with sufficient energy to keep him at any rate from reproach he was kind and charitable to the poor punctual in his services forbearing with the farmers around him mild with his brother clergyman and indifferent to aught that bishop or archdeacon might think or say of him i do not name this latter attribute as a virtue but as a fact but all these points were as nothing in the known character of mr woolathy of oxney colne he was the antiquarian of dartmoor that was his line of life it was in that capacity that he was known to the devonshire world it was as such that he journeyed about with his humble carpet-bag staying away from his parsonage a night or two at a time it was in that character that he received now and again stray visitors in the single spare bedroom not friends asked to see him and his girl because of their friendship but men who knew something as to this buried stone or that old landmark in all these things his daughter let him have his own way assisting and encouraging him that was his line of life and therefore she respected it but in all other matters she chose to be paramount at the parsonage mr woolathy was a little man who always wore except on sundays grey clothes clothes of so light a grey that they would hardly have been regarded as clerical in a district less remote he had now reached a goodly age being full seventy years old but still he was wiry and active and showed but few symptoms of decay his head was bald and the few remaining locks that surrounded it were nearly white but there was a look of energy about his mouth and a humour in his light grey eye which forbade those who knew him to regard him altogether as an old man as it was he could walk from oxney colne to Pricetown, fifteen long Devonshire miles across the moor, and he who could do that could hardly be regarded as too old for work. But our present story will have more to do with his daughter than with him. A pretty girl, I have said, was Patience Woolathy, and one, too, in many ways remarkable. She had taken her outlook into life, weighing the things which she had and those which she had not, in a manner very unusual and as a rule not always desirable for a young lady the things which she had not were very many she had not society she had not a fortune she had not any assurance of future means of livelihood she had not high hope of procuring for herself a position in life by marriage she had not that excitement and pleasure in life which she read of in such books as found their way down to oxney colne parsonage it would be easy to add to the list of the things which she had not and this list against herself she made out with the utmost vigour the things which she had or those rather which she assured herself of having were much more easily counted she had the birth and education of a lady the strength of a healthy woman and a will of her own such was the list as she made it out for herself and i protest that i assert no more than the truth in saying that she never added to it either beauty wit or talent i began these descriptions by saying that oxney colne would of all places be the best spot from which a tourist could visit those parts of devonshire but for the fact that he could obtain there none of the accommodation which tourists require 
a brother antiquarian might perhaps in those days have done so seeing that there was as i have said a spare bedroom at the parsonage any intimate friend of miss le smerger's might be as fortunate for she was also so provided at oxney colne by which name her house was known but miss le smerger was not given to extensive hospitality and it was only to those who were bound to her either by ties of blood or of very old friendship that she delighted to open her doors as her old friends were very few in number as those few lived at a distance and as her nearest relations were higher in the world than she was and were said by herself to look down upon her the visits made to oxney colne were few and far between but now at the period of which i am writing such a visit was about to be made miss le smerger had a younger sister who had inherited a property in the parish of oxney colne equal to that of the lady who lived there but this younger sister had inherited beauty also and she therefore in early life had found sundry lovers one of whom became her husband she had married a man even then well to do in the world but now rich and almost mighty a member of parliament a lord of this and that board a man who had a house in eaton square and a park in the north of england and in this way her course of life had been very much divided from that of our miss le smerger but the lord of the government board had been blessed with various children and perhaps it was now thought expedient to look after aunt penelope's devonshire acres aunt penelope was empowered to leave them to whom she pleased and though it was thought in eaton square that she must as a matter of course leave them to one of the family nevertheless a little cousinly intercourse might make the thing more certain i will not say that this was the sole cause for such a visit but in these days a visit was to be made by captain broughton to his aunt now captain john broughton was the second son of alfonso broughton of clapham park and eaton square member of parliament and lord of the aforesaid government board and what do you mean to do with him patience woolathy asked of miss le smerger when that lady walked over from the colne to say that her nephew john was to arrive on the following morning do with him why i shall bring him over here to talk to your father he'll be too fashionable for that and papa won't trouble his head about him if he finds that he doesn't care for dartmoor then he may fall in love with you my dear well yes there's that resource at any rate and for your sake i dare say i should be more civil to him than papa but he'll soon get tired of making love to me and what you'll do then i cannot imagine that miss woolathy felt no interest in the coming of the captain i will not pretend to say the advent of any stranger with whom she would be called on to associate must be a matter of interest to her in that secluded place and she was not so absolutely unlike other young ladies that the arrival of an unmarried young man would be the same to her as the advent of some patriarchal paterfamilias in taking that outlook into life of which i have spoken she had never said to herself that she despised those things from which other girls received the excitement the joys and the disappointment of their lives she had simply given herself to understand that very little of such things would come in her way and that it behoved her to live to live happily if such might be possible without experiencing the need of them she had heard when there was no thought of any such visit to oxney colne that john broughton was a handsome clever man one who thought much of himself and was thought much of by others that there had been some talk of his marrying a great heiress which marriage however had not taken place through unwillingness on his part and that he was on the whole a man of more mark in the world than the ordinary captains of ordinary regiments captain broughton came to oxney colne stayed there a fortnight the intended period for his projected visit having been fixed at three or four days and then went his way he went his way back to his london haunts the time of the year then being the close of the easter holidays but as he did so he told his aunt that he should assuredly return to her in the autumn and assuredly i shall be happy to see you john if you come with a certain purpose 
if you have no such purpose you had better remain away i shall assuredly come the captain had replied and then he had gone on his journey the summer passed rapidly by and very little was said between miss le smerger and miss willoughby about captain broughton in many respects nay i may say as to all ordinary matters no two women could well be more intimate with each other than they are and more than that they had the courage each to talk to the other with absolute truth as to things concerning themselves a courage in which dear friends often fail but nevertheless very little was said between them about captain john broughton all that was said may be here repeated john says that he shall return here in august miss le smerger said as patience was sitting with her in the parlour at oxney colne on the morning after that gentleman's departure he told me so himself said patience and as she spoke her round dark eyes assumed a look of more than ordinary self-will if miss le smerger had intended to carry the conversation any further she changed her mind as she looked at her companion then as i said the summer ran by and towards the close of the warm dry days of july miss le smerger sitting in the same chair in the same room again took up the conversation i got a letter from john this morning he says that he shall be here on the third does he he is very punctual to the time he named yes i fancy that he is a punctual man said patience i hope that you will be glad to see him said miss le smerger very glad to see him said patience with a bold clear voice and then the conversation was again dropped and nothing further was said till after captain broughton's second arrival in the parish four months had then passed since his departure and during that time miss woolworthy had performed all her usual duties in the accustomed course no one could discover that she had been less careful in her household matters than had been her wont less willing to go among her poor neighbours or less assiduous in her attentions to her father but not the less was there a feeling in the minds of those around her that some great change had come upon her she would sit during the long summer evenings on a certain spot outside the parsonage orchard at the top of a small sloping field in which their solitary cow was always pastured with a book on her knees before her but rarely reading there she would sit with the beautiful view down to the winding river below her watching the setting sun and thinking 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 of something of which she had never spoken often would miss le smerger come upon her there and sometimes would pass her even without a word but never never once did she dare to ask of the matter of her thoughts but she knew the matter well enough no confession was necessary to inform her that patience woolworthy was in love with john broughton ay in love to the full and entire loss of her whole heart on one evening she was so sitting till the july sun had fallen and hidden himself for the night when her father came upon her as he returned from one of his rambles on the moor patty he said you are always sitting there now is it not late will you not be cold no papa she said i shall not be cold but won't you come into the house i miss you when you come in so late and there's no time to say a word before we go to bed she got up and followed him into the parsonage and when they were in the sitting-room together and the door was closed she came up to him and kissed him papa she said would it make you very unhappy if i were to leave you leave me he said startled by the serious and almost solemn tone of her voice do you mean for always if i were to marry papa oh marry no that would not make me unhappy it would make me very happy patty to see you married to a man you would love very very happy though my days would be desolate without you that is papa what would you do if i went from you what would it matter patty i should be free at any rate from a load which often presses heavy on me now what will you do when i shall leave you a few more years and all will be over with me 
but who is it love has anybody said anything to you it was only an idea papa i don't often think of such a thing but i did think of it then and so the subject was allowed to pass by this had happened before the day of the second arrival had been absolutely fixed and made known to miss woolerthy and then that second arrival took place the reader may have understood from the words with which miss le smyrger authorized her nephew to make his second visit to oxney colne that miss woolerthy's passion was not altogether unauthorized captain broughton had been told that he was not to come unless he came with a certain purpose and having been so told he still persisted in coming there can be no doubt but that he well understood the purport to which his aunt alluded i shall assuredly come he had said and true to his word he was now there patience knew exactly the hour at which he must arrive at the station at newton abbot and the time also which it would take to travel over those twelve uphill miles from the station to oxney it need hardly be said that she paid no visit to miss le smyrger's house on that afternoon but she might have known something of captain broughton's approach without going thither his road to the colne passed by the parsonage gate and had patience sat even at her bedroom window she must have seen him but on such an evening she would not sit at her bedroom window she would do nothing which would force her to accuse herself of a restless longing for her lover's coming it was for him to seek her if he chose to do so he knew the way to the parsonage miss le smyrger good dear honest hearty miss le smyrger was in a fever of anxiety on behalf of her friend it was not that she wished her nephew to marry patience or rather that she had entertained any such wish when he first came among them she was not given to match-making and moreover thought or had thought within herself that they of oxney colne could do very well without any admixture from eaton square her plan of life had been that when old mr woolerthy was taken away from dartmoor patience should live with her and that when she also shuffled off her coil then patience woolerthy should be the maiden mistress of oxney colne of oxney colne and of mr cloyce's farm to the utter detriment of all the broughtons such had been her plan before nephew john had come among them a plan not to be spoken of till the coming of that dark day which should make patience an orphan but now her nephew had been there and all was to be altered miss le smyrger's plan would have provided a companion for her old age but that had not been her chief object she had thought more of patience than of herself and now it seemed that a prospect of a higher happiness was opening for her friend john she said as soon as the first greetings were over do you remember the last words that i said to you before you went away now for myself i much admire miss le smyrger's heartiness but i do not think much of her discretion it would have been better perhaps had she allowed things to take their course i can't say that i do said the captain at the same time the captain did remember very well what those last words had been i am so glad to see you so delighted to see you if 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 and then she paused for with all her courage she hardly dared to ask her nephew whether he had come there with the express purport of asking miss woolerthy to marry him to tell the truth for there is no room for mystery within the limits of this short story to tell i say at a word the plain and simple truth captain broughton had already asked the question on the day before he left oxney colne he had in set terms proposed to the parson's daughter and indeed the words the hot and frequent words which previously to that had fallen like sweetest honey into the ears of patience woolerthy had made it imperative on him to do so when a man in such a place as that has talked to a girl of love day after day must he not talk of it to some definite purpose on the day in which he leaves her or if he does not must he not submit to be regarded as false selfish and almost fraudulent 
Captain Broughton, however, had asked the question honestly and truly. He had done so honestly and truly, but in words, or perhaps simply with a tone, that had hardly sufficed to satisfy the proud spirit of the girl he loved. She by that time had confessed to herself that she loved him with all her heart, but she had made no such confession to him. To him she had spoken no word, granted no favour, that any lover might rightfully regard as a token of love returned. She had listened to him as he spoke, and bade him keep such sayings for the drawing-rooms of his fashionable friends. Then he had spoken out, and had asked her for that hand, not perhaps as a suitor tremulous with hope, but as a rich man who knows that he can command that which he desires to purchase. "'You should think more of this,' she had said to him at last. "'If you would really have me for your wife, it will not be much to you to return here again.' when time for thinking of it shall have passed by. With these words she had dismissed him, and now he had again come back to Oxney Colne. But still she would not place herself at the window to look for him, nor dress herself in other than her simple morning country dress, nor omit one item of her daily work. If he wished to take her at all, he should wish to take her as she really was, in her plain country life but he should take her also with full observance of all those privileges which maidens are allowed to claim from their lovers. He should curtail no ceremonious observance because she was the daughter of a poor country parson who would come to him without a shilling, whereas he stood high in the world's books. He had asked her to give him all that she had, and that all she was ready to give, without stint but the gift must be valued before it could be given or received. He also was to give her as much, and she would accept it as being beyond all price, but she would not allow that that which was offered to her was in any degree the more precious because of his outward worldly standing. End of The Parson's Daughter of Oxney Colne by Anthony Trollope Part 1「Victorian Short Stories – Stories of Courtship」by Hubert Crackenthorpe and others The Parson's Daughter of Oxney Colne by Anthony Trollope This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson the parson's daughter of oxney colne part two she would not pretend to herself that she thought he would come to her that afternoon and therefore she busied herself in the kitchen and about the house giving directions to her two maids as though the day would pass as all other days did pass in that household they usually dined at four and she rarely in these summer months went far from the house before that hour at four precisely she sat down with her father and then said that she was going up as far as helpholm after dinner helpholm was a solitary farmhouse in another parish on the border of the moor and mr woolsey asked her whether he should accompany her do papa she said if you are not too tired and yet she had thought how probable it might be that she should meet john broughton on her walk and so it was arranged but just as dinner was over, Mr. Woolsey remembered himself. "'Gracious me,' he said, "'how my memory is going. "'Gribbles from Ivybridge and old John Poulter from Bovey "'are coming to meet here by appointment. "'You can't put help home off till tomorrow.' "'Patience, however, never put off anything, "'and therefore at six o'clock, "'when her father had finished his slender modicum of toddy, she tied on her hat and went on her walk she started forth with a quick step and left no word to say by which route she would go as she passed up along the little lane which led towards oxney colne she would not even look to see if he was coming towards her and when she left the road passing over a stone stile into a little path which ran first through the upland fields and then across the moor ground towards help home 
she did not look back once or listen for his coming step she paid her visit remaining upwards of an hour with the old bedridden mother of the farmer of help home god bless you my darling said the old lady as she left her and send you someone to make your own path bright and happy through the world these words were still ringing in her ears with all their significance as she saw john broughton waiting for her at the first stile which she had to pass after leaving the farmer's haggard patty he said as he took her hand and held it close within both his own what a chase i have had after you and who asked you captain broughton she asked smiling if the journey was too much for your poor london strength could you not have waited till to-morrow morning when you would have found me at the parsonage but she did not draw her hand away from him or in any way pretend that he had not a right to accost her as a lover no i could not wait i am more eager to see those i love than you seem to be how do you know whom i love or how eager i might be to see them there is an old woman there whom i love and i have thought nothing of this walk with the object of seeing her and now slowly drawing her hand away from him she pointed to the farmhouse which she had left patty he said after a minute's pause during which she had looked full into his face with all the force of her bright eyes i have come from london to-day straight down here to oxney and from my aunt's house close upon your footsteps after you to ask you that one question do you love me what a hercules she said again laughing do you really mean that you left london only this morning why you must have been five hours in a railway carriage and two in a post-chaise not to talk of the walk afterwards you ought to take more care of yourself captain broughton he would have been angry with her for he did not like to be quizzed had she not put her hand on his arm as she spoke and the softness of her touch had redeemed the offence of her words all that i have done said he that i may hear one word from you that any word of mine should have such potency but let us walk on or my father will take us for some of the standing stones of the moor how have you found your aunt if you only knew the cares that have sat on her dear shoulders for the last week past in order that your high mightiness might have a sufficiency to eat and drink in these desolate half-starved regions she might have saved herself such anxiety no one can care less for such things than i do and yet i think i have heard you boast of the cook of your club and then again there was a silence for a minute or two patty said he stopping again in the path answer my question i have a right to demand an answer do you love me and what if i do what if i have been so silly as to allow your perfections to be too many for my weak heart what then captain broughton it cannot be that you love me or you would not joke now perhaps not indeed she said it seemed as though she were resolved not to yield an inch in her own humour and then again they walked on patty he said once more i shall get an answer from you to-night this evening now during this walk or i shall return to-morrow and never revisit this spot again oh captain broughton how should we ever manage to live without you very well he said up to the end of this walk i can bear it all and one word spoken then will mend it all during the whole of this time she felt that she was ill using him she knew that she loved him with all her heart that it would nearly kill her to part with him that she had heard his renewed offer with an ecstasy of joy she acknowledged to herself that he was giving proof of his devotion as strong as any which a girl could receive from her lover and yet she could hardly bring herself to say the word he longed to hear that word once said and then she knew that she must succumb to her love for ever that word once said and there would be nothing for her but to spoil him with her idolatry that word once said and she must continue to repeat it into his ears till perhaps he might be tired of hearing it and now he had threatened her and how could she speak it after that she certainly would not speak it unless he asked her again without such threat and so they walked on again in silence 
patty he said at last by the heavens above you shall answer me do you love me she now stood still and almost trembled as she looked up into his face she stood opposite to him for a moment and then placing her two hands on his shoulders she answered him i do i do i do she said with all my heart with all my heart with all my heart and strength and then her head fell upon his breast captain broughton was almost as much surprised as delighted by the warmth of the acknowledgment made by the eager-hearted passionate girl whom he now held within his arms she had said it now the words had been spoken and there was nothing for her but to swear to him over and over again with her sweetest oaths that those words were true true as her soul and very sweet was the walk down from thence to the parsonage gate he spoke no more of the distance of the ground or the length of his day's journey but he stopped her at every turn that he might press her arm the closer to his own that he might look into the brightness of her eyes and prolong his hour of delight there were no more gibes now on her tongue no raillery at his london finery no laughing comments on his coming and going with downright honesty she told him everything how she had loved him before her own heart was warranted in such a passion how with much thinking she had resolved that it would be unwise to take him at his first word and had thought it better that he should return to london and then think it over how she had almost repented of her courage when she had feared during those long summer days that he would forget her and how her heart had leapt for joy when her old friend had told her that he was coming and yet said he you were not glad to see me oh was i not glad you cannot understand the feelings of a girl who has lived secluded as i have done glad is no word for the joy i felt but it was not seeing you that i cared for so much it was the knowledge that you were near me once again i almost wished now that i had not seen you till to-morrow but as she spoke she pressed his arm and this caress gave the lie to her last words no do not come in to-night she said when she reached the little wicket that led up to the parsonage indeed you shall not i could not behave myself properly if you did but i don't want you to behave properly oh i am to keep that for london am i but nevertheless captain broughton i will not invite you either to tea or to supper to-night surely i may shake hands with your father not to-night not till john i may tell him may i not i must tell him at once certainly said he and then you shall see him to-morrow let me see at what hour shall i bid you come to breakfast no indeed what on earth would your aunt do with her broiled turkey and the cold pie i have got no cold pie for you i hate cold pie what a pity but john i should be forced to leave you directly after breakfast come down come down at two or three and then i will go back with you to aunt penelope i must see her to-morrow and so at last the matter was settled and the happy captain as he left her was hardly resisted in his attempt to press her lips to his own when she entered the parlour in which her father was sitting there still with gribbles and poulter discussing some knotty point of devon law so patience took off her hat and sat herself down waiting till they should go for full an hour she had to wait and then gribbles and poulter did go but it was not in such matters as this that patience woolathy was impatient she could wait and wait and wait curbing herself for weeks and months while the thing waited for was in her eyes good but she could not curb her hot thoughts or her hot words when things came to be discussed which she did not think to be good papa she said when gribbles's long-drawn last word had been spoken at the door do you remember how i asked you the other day what you would say if i were to leave you yes surely he replied looking up at her in astonishment i am going to leave you now she said dear dearest father how am i to go from you going to leave me said he thinking of her visit to help home and thinking of nothing else now there had been a story about help home 
that bedridden old lady there had a stalwart son who was now the owner of the help home pastures but though owner in fee of all those wild acres and of the cattle which they supported he was not much above the farmers around him either in manners or education he had his merits however for he was honest well to do in the world and modest withal how strong love had grown up springing from neighbourly kindness between our patients and his mother it needs not here to tell but rising from it had come another love or an ambition which might have grown to love the young man after much thought had not dared to speak to miss woolworthy but had sent a message by miss Le Smerger. if there could be any hope for him he would present himself as a suitor on trial he did not owe a shilling in the world and had money by him saved he wouldn't ask the parson for a shilling of fortune such had been the tenor of his message and miss Le Smerger had delivered it faithfully he does not mean it patience had said with her stern voice indeed he does my dear you may be sure he is in earnest miss Le Smerger had replied and there is not an honester man in these parts tell him said patience not attending to the latter portion of her friend's last speech that it cannot be make him understand you know and tell him also that the matter shall be thought of no more the matter had at any rate been spoken of no more but the young farmer still remained a bachelor and help home still wanted a mistress but all this came back upon the parson's mind when his daughter told him that she was about to leave him yes dearest she said and as she spoke she now knelt at his knees i have been asked in marriage and i have given myself away well my love if you will be happy i hope i shall i think i shall but you papa you will not be far from us oh yes in london in london captain broughton lives in london generally and has captain broughton asked you to marry him yes papa who else is he not good will you not love him oh papa do not say that i am wrong to love him he never told her his mistake or explained to her that he had not thought it possible that the high-placed son of the london great man shall have fallen in love with his undowered daughter but he embraced her and told her with all his enthusiasm that he rejoiced in her joy and would be happy in her happiness my own patty he said i have ever owned that you were too good for this life of ours here and then the evening wore away into the night with many tears but still with much happiness captain broughton as he walked back to oxney colne made up his mind that he would say nothing on the matter to his aunt till the next morning he wanted to think over it all and to think it over if possible by himself he had taken a step in life the most important that a man is ever called on to take and he had to reflect whether or no he had taken it with wisdom have you seen her said miss Le Smerger very anxiously when he came into the drawing-room miss woolworthy you mean said he yes i've seen her as i found her out i took a long walk and happened to meet her do you know aunt i think i'll go to bed i was up at five this morning and have been on the move ever since miss Le Smerger perceived that she was to hear nothing that evening so she handed him his candlestick and allowed him to go to his room but captain broughton did not immediately retire to bed nor when he did so was he able to sleep at once had this step that he had taken been a wise one he was not a man who in worldly matters had allowed things to arrange themselves for him as in the case with so many men he had formed views for himself and had a theory of life money for money's sake he had declared to himself to be bad money as a concomitant to things which were in themselves good he had declared to himself to be good also that concomitant in his affair of his marriage he had now missed well he had made up his mind to that and would put up with the loss he had means of living of his own though means not so extensive as might have been desirable 
that it would be well for him to become a married man looking merely to that state of life as opposed to his present state he had fully resolved on that point therefore there was nothing to repent that patty woolathy was good affectionate clever and beautiful he was sufficiently satisfied it would be odd indeed if he were not so satisfied now seeing that for the last four months he had declared to himself daily that she was so with many inward asseverations and yet though he repeated now again that he was satisfied i do not think that he was so fully satisfied of it as he had been throughout the whole of those four months it is sad to say so but i fear i fear that such was the case when you have your plaything how much of the anticipated pleasure vanishes especially if it have been won easily he had told none of his family what were his intentions in this second visit to devonshire and now he had to bethink himself whether they would be satisfied what would his sister say she who had married the honourable augustus gumbleton gold stick in waiting to her majesty's privy council would she receive patience with open arms and make much of her about london and then how far would london suit patience or would patience suit london there would be much for him to do in teaching her and it would be well for him to set about the lesson without loss of time so far he got that night but when the morning came he went a step further and began mentally to criticise her manner to himself it had been very sweet that warm that full that ready declaration of love yes it had been very sweet but but when after her little jokes she did confess her love had she not been a little too free for feminine excellence a man likes to be told that he is loved but he hardly wishes that the girl he is to marry should fling herself at his head ah me yes it was thus he argued to himself as on that morning he went through the arrangements of his toilet then he was a brute you say my pretty reader i have never said that he was not a brute but this i remark that many such brutes are to be met with in the beaten paths of the world's high highway when patience woolathy had answered him coldly bidding him go back to london and think over his love while it seemed from her manner that at any rate as yet she did not care for him while he was absent from her and therefore longing for her the possession of her charms her talent and bright honesty of purpose had seemed to him a thing most desirable now they were his own they had in fact been his own from the first the heart of this country-bred girl had fallen at the first word from his mouth had she not confessed to him she was very nice very nice indeed he loved her dearly but had he not sold himself too cheaply i by no means say that he was not a brute but whether brute or no he was an honest man and had no remotest dream either then on that morning or during the following days on which such thoughts pressed more thickly on his mind of breaking away from his pledged word at breakfast on that morning he told all to miss lesmerger and that lady with warm and gracious intentions confided to him her purpose regarding her property i have always regarded patience as my heir she said and shall do so still oh indeed said captain broughton but it is a great great pleasure to me to think that she will give back the little property to my sister's child you will have your mother's and thus it will all come together again ah said captain broughton he had his own ideas about property and did not even under existing circumstances like to hear that his aunt considered herself at liberty to leave the acres away to one who was by blood quite a stranger to the family does patience know of this he asked not a word said miss lesmerger and then nothing more was said upon the subject on that afternoon he went down and received the parson's benediction and congratulations with good grace patience said very little on the occasion and indeed was absent during the greater part of the interview the two lovers then walked up to oxney colne and there were more benedictions and more congratulations 
all went merry as a marriage bell at any rate as far as patience was concerned not a word had yet fallen from that dear mouth not a look had yet come over that handsome face which tended in any way to mar her bliss her first day of acknowledged love was a day altogether happy and when she prayed for him as she knelt beside her bed there was no feeling in her mind that any fear need disturb her joy i will pass over the next three or four days very quickly merely saying that patience did not find them so pleasant as that first day of her engagement there was something in her lover's manner something which at first she could not define which by degrees seemed to grate against her feelings he was sufficiently affectionate that being a matter on which she did not require much demonstration but joined to his affection there seemed to be she hardly liked to suggest to herself a harsh word but could it be possible that he was beginning to think that she was not good enough for him and then she asked herself the question was she good enough for him if there were any doubt about that the match should be broken off though she tore her own heart out in the struggle the truth however was this that he had begun that teaching which he had already found to be so necessary now had any one essayed to teach patience german or mathematics with that young lady's free consent i believe she would have been found a meek scholar but it was not probable that she would be meek when she found a self-appointed tutor teaching her manners and conduct without her consent so matters went on for four or five days and on the evening of the fifth day captain broughton and his aunt drank tea at the parsonage nothing very especial occurred but as the parson and miss lesmerger insisted on playing backgammon with devoted perseverance during the whole evening broughton had a good opportunity of saying a word or two about those changes in his lady-love which a life in london would require and some word he said also some single slight word as to the higher station in life to which he would exalt his bride patience bore it for her father and miss lesmerger were in the room she bore it well speaking no syllable of anger and enduring for the moment the implied scorn of the old parsonage then the evening broke up and captain broughton walked back to oxney colne with his aunt patty her father said to her before they went to bed he seems to me to be a most excellent young man dear papa she answered kissing him and terribly deep in love said mr woolathy oh i don't know about that she answered as she left him with her sweetest smile but though she could thus smile at her father's joke she had already made up her mind that there was still something to be learned as to her promised husband before she could place herself altogether in his hands she would ask him whether he thought himself liable to injury from this proposed marriage and though he should deny any such thought she would know from the manner of his denial what his true feelings were and he too on that night during his silent walk with miss lesmerger had entertained some similar thoughts i fear she is obstinate he had said to himself and then he had half accused her of being sullen also if that be her temper what a life of misery i have before me have you fixed the date yet his aunt asked him as they came near to the house no not yet i don't know whether it will suit me to fix it before i leave why it was but the other day you were in such a hurry ah uh, yes i have thought more about it since then i should have imagined that this would depend on what patty thinks said miss lesmerger standing up for the privileges of her sex it is presumed that the gentleman is always ready as soon as the lady will consent yes in ordinary cases it is so but when a girl is taken out of her own sphere her own sphere let me caution you master john not to talk to patty about her own sphere aunt penelope as patience is to be my wife and not yours i must claim permission to speak to her on such subjects as may seem suitable to me and then they parted not in the best humour with each other on the following day captain broughton and miss woolathy did not meet till the evening she had said before those few ill-omened words had passed her lover's lips 
that she would probably be at Miss Le Smyrger's house on the following morning. Those ill-omened words did pass her lover's lips, and then she remained at home. This did not come from sullenness, nor even from anger, but from a conviction that it would be well that she should think much before she met him again. Nor was he anxious to hurry a meeting. His thought, his base thought, was this, that she would be sure to come up to the colne after him. But she did not come, and therefore in the evening he went down to her, and asked her to walk with him. They went away by the path that led by help home, and little was said between them till they had walked some mile together. Patience, as they went along the path, remembered almost to the letter the sweet words which had greeted her ears as she came down that way with him on the night of his arrival. But he remembered nothing of that sweetness then. Had he not made an ass of himself during these last six months? That was the thought which very much had possession of his mind. Patience, he said at last, having hitherto spoken only an indifferent word now and again since they had left the parsonage, Patience, I hope you realise the importance of the step which you and I are about to take. Of course I do, she answered. What an odd question that is for you to ask. Because, he said, sometimes I almost doubt it. It seems to me as though you thought you could remove yourself from here to your new home with no more trouble than when you go from home to the colne. Is that meant for a reproach, Job? No, not for a reproach, but for advice. "'Certainly not for a reproach. I am glad of that. "'But I should wish to make you think how great is the leap in the world which you are about to take.' "'Then again they walked on for many steps before she answered him. "'Tell me then, John,' she said, when she had sufficiently considered what words she would speak. "'And as she spoke, a dark bright colour suffused her face, and her eyes flashed almost with anger. "'What leap do you mean?' "'Do you mean a leap upwards? "'Well, yes, I hope it will be so. "'In one sense, certainly, it would be a leap upwards. "'To be the wife of the man I loved, "'to have the privilege of holding his happiness in my hand, "'to know that I was his own, "'the companion whom he had chosen out of all the world, "'that would indeed be a leap upward, "'a leap almost to heaven, if all that were so.' "'But if you mean upwards in any other sense—' "'I was thinking of the social scale. "'Then, Captain Broughton, your thoughts were doing me a dishonour. "'Doing you dishonour? "'Yes, doing me dishonour. "'That your father is, in the world's esteem, a greater man than mine, is doubtless true enough. "'That you, as a man, are richer than I am as a woman, is doubtless also true. "'But you dishonour me, and yourself also— if these things can weigh with you now patience i think you can hardly know what words you are saying to me pardon me but i think i do nothing that you can give me no gifts of that description can weigh aught against that which i am giving you if you had all the wealth and rank of the greatest lord in the land it would count as nothing in such a scale if as i have not doubted if in return for my heart you have given me yours, then, then, then you have paid me fully. But when gifts such as those are going, nothing else can count even as a make-weight. I do not quite understand you, he answered after a pause. I fear you are a little high-flown. And then, while the evening was still early, they walked back to the parsonage almost without another word. Captain Broughton, at this time, had only one more full day to remain at Oxney Colne. On the afternoon following that, he was going as far as Exeter, and thence returned to London. Of course, it was to be expected that the wedding day would be fixed before he went, and much had been said about it during the first day or two of his engagement. Then he had pressed for an early time, and Patience, with a girl's usual diffidence, had asked for some little delay but now nothing was said on the subject and how was it probable that such a matter could be settled after such a conversation as that which i have related that evening mr smyrger asked whether the day had been fixed no said captain broughton harshly nothing has been fixed but it will be arranged before you go 
probably not he said and then the subject was dropped for the time john she said just before she went to bed if there be anything wrong between you and patience i conjure you to tell me you had better ask her he replied i can tell you nothing on the following morning he was much surprised by seeing patience on the gravel path before miss le smirger's gate immediately after breakfast he went to the door to open it for her and she as she gave him her hand told him that she came up to speak to him there was no hesitation in her manner nor any look of anger in her face but there was in her gait and form in her voice and countenance a fixedness of purpose which he had never seen before or at any rate had never acknowledged certainly said he shall i come out with you or will you come upstairs we can sit down in the summer-house she said and thither they both went captain broughton she said and she began her task the moment that they were both seated you and i have engaged ourselves as man and wife but perhaps we have been over rash how so said he it may be and indeed i will say more it is the case that we have made this engagement without knowing enough of each other's character i have not thought so the time will perhaps come when you will so think but for the sake of all that we most value let it come before it is too late what would be our fate how terrible would be our misery if such a thought should come to either of us after we have linked our lots together there was a solemnity about her as she thus spoke which almost repressed him which for a time did prevent him from taking that tone of authority which on such a subject he would choose to adopt but he recovered himself i hardly think this comes well from you he said from whom else should it come who else can fight my battle for me and john who else can fight that same battle on your behalf i tell you this that with your mind standing towards me as it does stand at present you could not give me your hand at the altar with true words and a happy conscience is it not true you have half repented of your bargain already is it not so he did not answer her but getting up from his seat walked to the front of the summer-house and stood there with his back turned upon her it was not that he meant to be ungracious but in truth he did not know how to answer her he had half repented of his bargain john she said getting up and following him so that she could put her hand upon his arm i have been very angry with you angry with me he said turning sharp upon her yes angry with you you would have treated me like a child but that feeling has gone now i am not angry now there is my hand the hand of a friend let the words that have been spoken between us be as though they had not been spoken let us both be free do you mean it he asked certainly i mean it as she spoke these words her eyes were filled with tears in spite of all the efforts she could make to restrain them but he was not looking at her and her efforts had sufficed to prevent any sob from being audible with all my heart he said and it was manifest from his tone that he had no thought of her happiness as he spoke it was true that she had been angry with him angry as she had herself declared but nevertheless in what she had said and what she had done she had thought more of his happiness than of her own now she was angry once again with all your heart captain broughton well so be it if with all your heart then is the necessity so much the greater you go to-morrow shall we say farewell now patience i am not going to be lectured certainly not by me shall we say farewell now yes if you are determined i am determined farewell captain broughton you have all my wishes for your happiness and she held out her hand to him patience he said and he looked at her with a dark frown as though he would strive to frighten her into submission if so he might have saved himself any such attempt farewell captain broughton give me your hand for i cannot stay he gave her his hand hardly knowing why he did so she lifted it to her lips and kissed it and then leaving him passed from the summer-house down through the wicket-gate and straight home to the parsonage during the whole of that day she said no word to any one of what had occurred when she was once more at home she went about her household affairs as she had done on that day of his arrival 
when she sat down to dinner with her father he observed nothing to make him think that she was unhappy nor during the evening was there any expression in her face or any tone in her voice which excited his attention on the following morning captain broughton called at the parsonage and the servant girl brought word to her mistress that he was in the parlour but she would not see him laws miss you ain't a quarrelled with your beau the poor girl said no not quarrelled she said but give him that it was a scrap of paper containing a word or two in pencil it is better that we should not meet again god bless you and from that day to this now more than ten years they have never met papa she said to her father that afternoon dear papa do not be angry with me it is all over between me and john broughton dearest you and i will not be separated it would be useless here to tell how great was the old man's surprise and how true his sorrow as the tale was told to him no cause was given for anger with any one not a word was spoken against the suitor who had on that day returned to london with a full conviction that now at least he was relieved from his engagement patty my darling child he said may god grant that it be for the best it is for the best she answered stoutly for this place i am fit and i much doubt whether i am fit for any other on that day she did not see miss le smirger but on the following morning knowing that captain broughton had gone off having heard the wheels of the carriage as they passed by the parsonage gate on his way to the station she walked up to the colne he has told you i suppose said she yes said miss le smirger and i will never see him again unless he asks your pardon on his knees i have told him so i would not even give him my hand as he went but why so thou kindest one the fault was mine more than his i understand i have eyes in my head said the old maid i have watched him for the last four or five days if you could have kept the truth to yourself and bade him keep off from you he would have been at your feet now licking the dust from your shoes but dear friend i do not want a man to lick dust from my shoes ah you are a fool you do not know the value of your own wealth true i have been a fool i was a fool to think that one coming from such a life as he has led could be happy with such as i am i know the truth now i have bought the lesson dearly but perhaps not too dearly seeing that it will never be forgotten there was but little more said about the matter between our three friends at oxney colne what indeed could be said miss le smirger for a year or two still expected that her nephew would return and claim his bride but he has never done so nor has there been any correspondence between them patience woolothy had learned her lesson dearly she had given her whole heart to the man and though she so bore herself that no one was aware of the violence of her struggle nevertheless the struggle within her bosom was very violent she never told herself that she had done wrong she never regretted her loss but yet yet the loss was very hard to bear he also had loved her but he was not capable of a love which could much injure his daily peace her daily peace was gone for many a day to come her father is still living but there is a curate now in the parish in conjunction with him and with miss le smirger she spends her time in the concerns of the parish in her own eyes she is a confirmed old maid and such is my opinion also the romance of her life was played out in that summer she never sits now lonely on the hillside thinking how much she might do for one whom she really loved but with a large heart she loves many and with no romance she works hard to lighten the burdens of those she loves as for captain broughton all the world knows that he did marry that great heiress with whom his name was once before connected and that he is now a useful member of parliament working on committees three or four days a week with zeal that is indefatigable sometimes not often as he thinks of patience woolothy a smile comes across his face End of The Parson's Daughter of Oxney Colne by Anthony Trollope Part 2